They tell the story that um, Lucy comes home from school and she's studying biology, the origin of our species. And uh, as you can imagine, a child is confused by these ideas. So are we adults, but the children express it. And uh, she asks her mother, so where do we come from? Where do we originate from? And her mother breaks out into a warm smile. She says, I always was waiting for you to ask me this question. Sit down. And she begins to share the yichas, the genealogy, the pedigree, where they come from. She said, we had a grandfather from a small town in uh, Poland, a grandmother from Czechoslovakia. A few generations back, we had a great-grandfather who was an author of a very important work on Torah law, halacha. And the further back we go, the better it gets, all the way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Okay, when her father comes home, Lucy asks her father the same question. And uh, her father, in stark contrast to her mother's reaction, uh, suddenly gets all disturbed and says, I've been always uh, dreading this day. And they sit down, brace yourself, and he says, well, we originate from apes. And before that, from amphibians. And before that, from uh, bacteria. As far back as we can figure out till this day, billions of years ago, from uh, a ball of gas. So a very different response, obviously. So Lucy's even more confused, and she runs back to her mother. She says, I don't understand. You told me one thing, Dad told me another. So her mother says, no, we both told you the truth. Your father told you about his side of the family. <laughs> and, and I'm telling you about my side of the family. Now, um, maybe this is the, here you heard it first, maybe this is the ultimate reconciliation between uh, creationism and evolution. Just a matter of which side of the family. But I say it because, of course, the title of my presentation here are Torah and Psychology Compatible. Which really, in a broader sense, you can say are science and religion compatible. And we know in the last few hundred years, there's been a real battle that continues to rage. Maybe it doesn't even rage anymore from a scientific point of view. Religion has been rendered irrelevant. And just the material for the masses, the ignorant, and so on, in the words of the French Enlightenment. Um, however, for many of us, the battle does exist. And it did rage for several centuries with essentially in the 16th, 17th, 18th century, the emergence after the Renaissance and then Enlightenment and so on, where a new model was presented. That instead of believing, for example, that volcanoes were due to God's anger, it basically are by our, our, our uh, geological forces under the earth. And the same thing with uh, both on a physics level and a scientific level, and of course also on a psychological level. And as such, we really are dealing with very two different schools of thought. So I want to address this from the perspective of a person who comes from a Torah background. However, let's begin with the most important thing of all. When you use a word, anyone trained in any uh, system knows, you begin to de define the word. What does the word psychology mean? I ask many psychologists, they don't even know what it means. Trained psychologists. The word psychology is, of course, rooted in Latin Greek. Logi is the study of. You have a lot of psychology. You have many words with the word end with L-O-G-Y. But psyche, what is the psyche rooted? Essentially, it's translated by everyone, including modern scientists, as the study of the soul. The soul. Psyche is rooted in the word soul, sometimes spirit. In the original Greek, actually, it's connected to breath, spirit, soul. Those are interchangeable words. And they're very relevant, as I'll soon address. Breath. You wouldn't think the study of the breath now, anyone that studied Torah knows immediately what that means. But let's just begin. That's the definition of the word psychology. And, um, but what has happened is this. If you look at a historical backdrop in the process, you know, psychology, the study of the soul, you could say the study of the psyche, the study of human condition, how we deal with issues. Obviously, people from the beginning of time struggled. They struggled with their own feelings, with their moods, and whatever is named today, whether it's called depression or it's called anxiety or it's called other issues, clinical disorders or emotional disorder, whatever it may be, humans have always struggled with it. Who did they turn to for help? So it was common until the last few hundred years that usually the priest and the physician were one. And this is documented. 
If you look in the Torah, for example, you went to the Kohen Asher B'yamecha. The Kohen, the priest, was considered the soul healer. Healers and religious leaders were one and the same. The best way maybe to describe Moses would be a soul doctor. But that changed in the last few centuries. It changed to the extent that I just want to read to you something. Professor Paul Bloom in Yale gives a talk about these topics, quoting Francis Crick, a winning, a Nobel winning priologist. So he called it the astonishing hypothesis. And this is coming to dispute Cartesian thinking, where human beings divided between the mind and the body, which modern thinkers say that's duality. And they want to create a more unified uh, attitude, so they created what's called the mechanical attitude and the mechanical model, and I'm quoting, you, your joys and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. As Lewis Carroll's Alice might have phrased it, you're nothing but a pack of neurons. And in this they felt, many and there are many thinkers that feel this way, that religion has to be taken out of the picture, soul has to be taken out of the picture, and it's actually, and they see it actually as a uh, conquest, as an achievement. That, that instead of Descartes, who said, I think therefore I am, which means there's a mind and a body, which then you have to deal with two different forces. It's now no longer duality, it's one thing, it's all one big machine. Parts of the machine are biological and physical, and parts of the machine are neurological and emotional. But it's all a machine, and stop trying to turn it into anything sublime, or majestic, or transcendent. Now, of course, this repels many people, not necessarily even religious people, because it's basically bringing human beings down to a level that were essentially machines. And if we're machines, what, what love? What about purpose and meaning? What about faith? What about so many of the noble forces that human beings that drive the best and bring out the best in us? But this is definitely a school of thought and must be acknowledged. Because to address this properly, you need to know all the different perspectives. And then you have those that actually say that religion is detrimental, not just irrelevant, detrimental to uh, psychology. It creates neurosis, even though Woody Allen, not a formal psychologist, but he probably has more influence than most psychologists, and any film of his, you know immediately, the neurotic Jew. And if you wouldn't have faith and religion and all that stuff, you wouldn't have neurosis because you wouldn't have conflict. So if we could all just have animal bliss, that would simplify matters. I remember once driving up to the mountains and there's a good New York City boy. I didn't see, you don't see animals too much. You see a few squirrels and pigeons and uh, I don't want to mention the rodents and so on, but, uh, um, but I saw an animal. I saw a behemoth, a cow. And I was watching the cow grazing in the fields and you could be quite envious. All day the, the cow grazes in the field, no mood changes, does not have to go to any therapy. It does what it has to do. It breeds, takes care of its young, it eats, and uh, that's really it. And you start thinking, wow, what a simple life. However, as we all know, it's not so simple <laughs> for us human beings to be that way. So there are those that actually, and let me quote um, a, uh, just one of many, Dr. Koenig, a psychiatrist and currently director of Duke Center for the Study of Religion and Spirituality. And he writes in a, in a study titled Religion and Medicine, the case for maintaining the continued separation between medicine and faith. Religion and medicine, he writes, have a long intertwined tumultuous history going back thousands of years. And only within the past two, three hundred years, less than 5% of recorded history, have these twin healing traditions been clearly separated. And he celebrates that. The split between religion and medicine became final and complete. And he basically, as I said, celebrating that element. Now, of course, this is in very, uh, this is the other extreme of the spectrum, the other side of the spectrum of what we're discussing here. You may be wondering why I'm bringing this up, because from a Torah, at least a Torah way of thinking, you want to stretch every idea and every angle to really appreciate what we have. So I think a good way to, uh, I'm not here to debate or counter this, but I think there's even a better way to do it is to really get back to the root, as I said, of psychology. You know, long before Freud, and long before Adler, and long before Viktor Frankl even, we Jews have been struggling with psychological issues from the beginning of time. All you have to do is read the story of the Garden of Eden, good and evil. 
And right there, just translated, even, you don't have to go into any even mystical or deeper interpretation. You see the struggle of man in choice, faith. Do we succumb to our most base desires and selfish and narcissistic attitudes, or do we uh, suppress that and allow ourselves to rise to the occasion and to be noble as transcendent human beings? So these issues, no one has to teach us as the Jewish people these concepts. However, it has not become in any way you could say institutionalized or turned into a science, where psychology today is considered a science. It's considered this is a professionals. And I think this is a critical component to address. And as I'll try to point out, make, make a case, that it's not about whether Torah and science, are, whether, to, whether Torah and psychology are compatible, but actually to come to recognize that Torah is psychology and the original psychology. And if we just go back to it and appreciate in the proper way and today, yes, with the professional tools and knowledge and academic uh, modalities that exist, we have a model that will supersede all other models. And this is not the pull rank, maybe it is, but it doesn't matter. The point is, it's to uh, clarify issues. So I think the best way to do this, as we Jews are very good at doing, is with a story. Why do I say a story? Because often you get trapped in abstract academic ideas and we forget the human touch. And of course, if psychology is to mean anything, there's a human touch. Hippocrates famously once said, it's more important to understand the person who has a disease than the disease itself. It's all about the person. There's no just, there is no such thing as a cookie cutter model. There are principles. So I want to begin with a story actually about the man that we are uh, honoring, we are discussing, Viktor Frankl. And I heard the story from Rabbi Yaakov Biederman, He's the Chabad Shliach, the Chabad Emissary in Vienna, Vienna, Austria. And I think through this story, even though it's a very beautiful, warm, and extremely actually quite uh, um, fascinating story, we can get an insight into Viktor Frankl's role and our general perspective on psychology, which I think when you step back and see the big picture is absolutely um, revolutionary. So Rabbi Yaakov Biederman, as I said, ambassador, of Chabad and the Rebavitch Rebbe in Vienna. Every year he would get a donation from Dr. Viktor Frankl. Now he knew who he was, and he was always, always, uh, always intrigued. Why would he be sending us a donation? He was not known to be anyone in the Jewish community. He was actually intermarried to a, to a, to a religious, devout Catholic woman. And, um, but you know, people send him a donation, you just take the money and you just deposit it, obviously. However, this, uh, this, uh, this mystery became, uh, the mystery was resolved a few in the year 1995. Into the Chabad house comes a woman, her name is Margaret Chayes, C-H-A-G-E-S, but Chayes is pronounced, some of you may know Marat Chayes. She originates, her maiden name was Hagar. She comes from the Vizhnitz uh, dynasty, the Vizhnitz Rebbes are Hagar. Her name is Margaret Chayes. She was an opera singer. In those years, she lived in Vienna, and she actually sang, I should add, Hitler, when he came to power and he was in Vienna. He actually heard her sing once or twice and was not aware that she was Jewish. A little while later, the opera house was closed down, and she, as many other Jews, was sent off. But she actually escaped, and they brought her to the United States. She ended up in Detroit. In 1995, she enters the Chabad house, and she speaks to Rabbi Biederman. She says, you may think you're the first ambassador of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the first liach, to come to Vienna. No, I'm here to tell you, you're not the first. I'm the first. And she relates a story that he had no clue, and no one had any clue until that point. She said in 1959, 1959, we're talking now 1995, almost 40 years earlier, she was in New York. She lived in Detroit, but her son-in-law was honored by a Chabad event. So as a result, she came for a personal audience to see the Lubavitcher Rebbe in New York, in Brooklyn. She was by the Rebbe and she talked her, told her story, began to cry about her, the losses of her families. 1959, it was right, very close to the, to the end of the war. The Rebbe consoled her. And then she, she mentioned that she plans to go back to Vienna, her birthplace. It wasn't, not, actually, her birthplace was not Vienna, it was Chernovitz, but she, she lived in Vienna. So the Rebbe said, when you go back, I'd like you to make contact with my secretary, and I have something I'd like you to do for me. Okay, a little while later, a few months later, she's planning her trip, and she calls uh, 770, 
Eastern Parkway, the Rebbe's secretary, and the Rebbe's message is the following. I'd like you to go to Vienna. He sent her two, mess, two, uh, two uh, missions, but one particular, there's a man called Dr. Viktor Frankl. He told him which university he teaches at. And I'd like you to go see, to him, see him and tell him the following words. He should remain strong. He should not give up, no matter what happens. If he continues and persists, he will prevail. No, she knew that this is the message. She comes to Vienna. Long story short, she goes to the university. He's not there. Where is he? He's not been here for several weeks. And they think that he's not in such a good state of mind. Which was true, because if you know what was going on then, and I'll tell it to you after the, at, the end of the, at the end of this uh, chapter here, what happened was she went and decided, you know what? She has the message. She, does, she wants to pass it on. She looked up where he lives, and she went and rang the bell. And who answers the door? His wife. She walks in, and there are, uh, this is the way she's put it, crucifixes, not one, but quite a few. So she thought this may be the wrong home. How the Rebbe, the Rebbe is sending her to such a home. Yeah, but it was him. And she says, Did Dr. Dr. Frankel live here? Yes. He comes out, and he wasn't exactly very uh, welcoming. He was very curt, and, and almost like he wanted to get rid of her. But then she said, I have a message to you from a rabbi in Brooklyn, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneers. His face changed. This is her words. His face changed, and he said, come in. He sat her down in the lounge. What, was, what is the message? And she told him exactly those words. Don't be disturbed. Don't, don't, don't be depressed. Stand strong. If you continue, you will prevail. She said, suddenly she never saw an adult man start to change in such a dramatic way. And he began to sob. He began to cry. She had no idea why. And he said to her, you cannot imagine this the, the moment that, this moment, and he shows her on the desk, his papers, he was ready to resign from the university. He was ready to move to Australia where his sister was. Because at that time in 1959, he was not exactly a popular man. He was living in Vienna, which was dominated by what he called Freudenisten. Students of Freud, which was the dominating like, school of thought there, and he was reviled. There were people who heckled him in his lectures. They, they, uh, they basically, um, it, and it got to him. And he said, as much as I suffered during the Holocaust, this was also a personal, because this was developing his professional career, his thoughts, and so on. And he was ready to give up. Obviously, this changed his whole attitude. And you'll soon see the words that he told Rabbi Biederman. And what happened next? He changed his plans. He went back and did exactly as the Rebbe encouraged him to do. And that year, Man's Search for Meaning was published in English for the first time. Till then, it was published in the German, the original. But that was when it was published, and it became a, uh, what it became. Everything changed after that. And not necessarily, I'm not talking miracles here. Simply because his attitude changed. Rabbi, Biederman, who heard the story from Margaret, always, that was skeptical, but he wanted to hear, really confirm it from Dr. Frankel himself. It was, too, it was like pretty mind-boggling. So he decided to meet him. The year 2000, he found the courage, he calls up Dr. Frankel, he wants a meeting. Dr. Frankel was not in a good state, he was not well. He was, uh, he was already at that point, how old would he have been? He was born in 1905, so we're talking about 85 years old. And doctor, the doctor said, I can't meet with you, but we can speak by phone. And he said to him, have you heard of the Lubavitcher Rebbe? He said, of course. And he asked about Margaret. He said, I don't think he remembered her name, but he, or maybe he did. I'm not, that, that's a point that needs to be uh, looked at. And he said, I, and he spoke in German, which is close to Yiddish. And he says, which means I'm very thankful to him. And I respect him greatly. And then he said the main words. He says, he saved me in the most critical time of my life. In the most critical time, he saved me. He didn't go into details, but it confirmed the story. And he didn't know who Rabbi Biederman was. And he said to Rabbi Biederman, you know, Chabad is a very good movement. You should donate to them. Even though he was sending the donations. So it was confirmed. And I'll just add one more footnote, which is not so relevant to the point I want to make, but very relevant in general to his life. Later, in the book, let me quote it so we know exactly the source. In a book written by, um, Haddon Klimberg wrote a book 
when life calls out to us, the love and life work of Victor and Ellie Frankel. Ellie was his second wife, the non-Jewish wife. The only authorized bi 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 biography of Victor and Eleanor. After his death, I asked Ellie if he actually made these prayers every day, whether Dr. Frankel actually prayed every day, because that was a rumor. And she responded, absolutely, he never missed a day. Every morning for more than 50 years, but nobody knew this. As they traveled the globe, Victor took the phylacteries with him, with them, tefillin. And everywhere, every morning he prayed, he uttered memorized words of Jewish prayers and psalms. After Victor died, I saw his phylacteries for the first time, the author writes. Eliot had placed them in the little cubicle with his few simple possessions. And then later, Frankel's non-Jewish son-in-law confirmed the same thing. So I thought it's interesting on in a day like this to mention some of these points. And again, it's not about transforming a, a, a particular thing, but I want to say is the main thing. This story to me, and I think if you all give it some thought, really captures not just a personal anecdote about Viktor Frankl and the Lavacher Rebbe and his Jewishness and his roots, but actually his psychology itself. Because here, imagine the irony. A man who developed this theory, logotherapy, man's search for meaning, that the will for meaning is the most powerful will in the human being, himself suffered a crisis that in many ways was much less than the Holocaust because he personally was not being validated and he was being invalidated and he was ready to quit the whole thing. So you know, it's like the irony, I don't want to repeat it, but the irony where the psychiatrist is helping people save lives and the next thing you find out, he committed suicide. Your psychiatrist, God forbid. And that was what's going on. So it wasn't just a matter of a personal crisis, it was actually a challenge to the whole idea. Now how the Rebbe understood that, I'm not going to get into speculation. So it wasn't just a moment I would submit that it was a moment that actually is historical in the context of the history of psychology and why we're here today. Because going back to the, to the duality, what was his main, the main, the main Frankl's break from Freud and Adler, as was alluded to and briefly mentioned by Dr. Schombach, was what drives a human being? Freud, called the father of psychology, you know, developed the concept, the id, which is called in Yiddish or German, s, the it, and there's the ich and the uberich, the ego and the superego in, the, in our translation. And the id is the pleasure principle, especially sexual pleasure, which is the drive for pleasure. The unconscious drive for pleasure is the most innate and most powerful force. And you need a superego and ego to override that innate uh, instinct and create some type of, the, 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 some kind of civility. I'll quote, I don't, I don't, I'm sure who wrote this, but someone described the way Freud describes the human personality as being basically, quote, a battlefield. He is a dark, he is a dark cellar in which a well-bred spinster lady, the superego, and a sex-crazed monkey, the id, are forever engaged in mortal combat, the struggle being referred, refereed by a rather nervous bank clerk, the ego. So very depressing, a picture of a human being. However, this became the dominant theory. And even today, though there are many detractors and many different schools of thought, of course, of course, Dr. Frankl himself, but Freud still remains a factor. He's the guy to disagree with, so to speak. And then Adler, the, the will for power, Nietzschean thinking, that power is the drive. So when Frankl came, and that wasn't just another will, it was a completely different one. For meaning, it was very radical. And especially, and I submit this, I don't have a record, I don't have evidence for this, but I would suggest that perhaps he was a more of a threat than anyone else, because he was countering the new God, which was science. Suddenly Frankl is reintroducing ideas that some considered, they called it, they called it psychobabble, religion, faith, even though it wasn't what he was pushing, but as Dr. Schombach mentioned, the unconscious God, religion and, religion and psychology, so it was a major threat. Freud's model and Adler's were far more consistent with the non-duality that they wanted in the mechanical model, that we at the end of the day were just animals. With all its profundity, but reintroducing soul was something that was very an anathema which till today remains, many of us are so resistant to. So Frankl's personal 
crisis was actually a crisis of this dilemma, are these two compatible? And as most of us would probably agree, without a soul in the picture, what exactly is therapy and psychology? But nevertheless, there are definitely thinkers, and especially then. So when the Rebbe's words came to him and said to him, don't not give up, which was really telling him, just follow your own logotherapy. Hold on to something you believe in. Then you'll be able to endure and prevail. It was actually a moment where it could have gone both ways. The other schools of thought could have won. And Frankl would have gone into the dust of history. We may never have heard of him. Or he fought on. So it wasn't just a small personal story. It's actually the question of the duality or the non-duality of soul and psychology. But as I'll soon explain, from a Torah point of view, there's also non-duality for a very different reason. We'll get back to that in a moment. Now, an interesting, another interesting that I'd like to point out, which very much captures the story of the Jewish people. Where did he discover, where was confirmed the truths of logotherapy and Frankl's man's search of meaning? Not in pleasant environment exactly. Not when things were going so well in the concentration camps, in the worst, maybe the biggest hell in history, the darkest moments, which of course, if you think about it from a scientific point of view, and I don't like to put it into scientific terms, that's really where you test human character. Not when everything is going well. You test it on extreme circumstances. What do people resort to? Now, yes, we know, and we're not gonna talk about that there were people who felt the lowest common denominator and things they did were embarrassed of. But there were people who rose to the occasion with such nobility, and that's what Frankl was able to see and witness. You know, they just tell the story of the Blozhna, and I'm saying it because Dr. Schombach reminded me when he said when you, the words of Dr. Frankl, you're tied above. So there's a Hasidic expression, when you're tied above, you don't fall below. I think it was the Blozhna Rebbe was in the camps as well, and some of his Hasidim. And they were in a camp where there was a particularly cruel and sadistic commander. And he liked to play, quote unquote, this game. And what was the game? The Jews had to dig wide trenches, and whoever jumps over the trench survives, and whoever doesn't is shot on the spot. So one chassid says to the Rebbe, he says to the Bozhan Rebbe, he says, enough is enough. How much can we endure? The dehumanization, the humiliation. Let's just die, and that's that. And the Rebbe, the Rebbe said, as long as God keeps us alive, we have to do everything possible to stay alive. And the game began. In the big havoc and mayhem, no one knew what happened, who survived, who didn't. They both actually survived. They didn't know that. The camps were liberated a few weeks later, and they met. They were both surprised to see each other. So he asked the, so he asked the Rebbe, the Blazhan of the Chassid, asked the Rebbe, Rebbe, you're not a young man. How did you make it over? How did you jump over those trenches? He said, I closed my eyes, and I held on to the coattails, to the kapota, to the coattails of my father and my grandfather and my great-grandfather. And he gave me the strength to jump. And but what about you? You're also not that young. How did you jump? He says, I held on to your coattails. So that's in other words, the same the concept. In, the, in that darkness, a entire psychology in the secular psychology world emerged. And I think about it. I'm thinking to myself, and what about Freud? Actually, I think Frankl writes the following words. I want to quote this. He writes, if Freud were in the concentration camps, he would have changed his position. Beyond the basic natural drives and instincts of people who have encountered the human capacity of self-transcendence, man is that being who invented the gas chambers of Auschwitz. However, he is also that being who entered those chambers upright with a Shema Yisrael on his lips. We who lived in concentration camps can remember the men who walked through the huts, comforting others, giving away their last piece of bread. They may be few in number, but they often offer sufficient proof that everything can be taken from a man. But one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way, cannot be taken. I think he writes in another place, he writes that if you have a what, you can deal with any, if you have a how, you can deal with any what. Or is it the other way? If you have a what, you can deal with any how. <laughs> okay, let's correct that. If you have a why, you can deal with any what, right? There we go. I'm not sure if he originated that, but uh, they, they, they stated in his name as well. So, so what you have is, in the darkest of places, he discovered the most beautiful of things. 
Now, I haven't studied Freud's life, but we all know he must have had an interesting mother. Uh, and that's where we often, many theories develop from there. In his own words, you know, whatever he says about the Oedipus complex and so on obviously applies to him, you know. And Adler as well. But one thing that strikes me is this, that the theories, whether it's pleasure principle, the will for pleasure or the will for um, power, both are self-oriented. My pleasure has nothing to do with your pleasure. My power actually goes against your power. Interesting. Meaning is everything but yourself. It's purpose that's outside of you, a meaning that precedes you and a meaning that will follow you, which is essentially going outside of yourself. So you take suffering and it teaches you how to go outside of yourself. That's essentially what it's about. And when you think in those terms, then you could realize that whether Frankl knew it consciously or not, and clearly he had some sense, he was an educated man, but I don't know how much Torah he actually studied. But this brings me back, I believe that Frankl is far more than just an interesting or important and critical uh, thinker developing the psychology of meaning, but he actually is like a juncture, like a uh, crossroads in history that gives us an opportunity to do something which is really radical and revolutionary. And that is what I said at the outset, to bring psychology to where it should be. And it's a non-dual perspective. Now you say non-dual, what do you mean? Body and soul, immediately there's a soul, there's a body. That's, that's duality as uh, Descartes argues. However, no. The Jewish context is very different. Now I go back to psychology breath. Soul. Let's begin with the beginning of the Bible. What does it say? It says the first description of the human being. And I'm not saying this even from a religious context. The Bible is probably the oldest published book. It's definitely the biggest bestseller, not even hitting the, the New York Times list because it sells more books than all the bestsellers put together. Okay? The Bible has captured the imagination of history. Four billion people on earth. 2.5 billion Christians and 1.8 billion Muslims and a few Jews see the Bible as the first holy book. What does it say when it describes the human being? Just let's go simple in cheder. So you think the human being is an intelligent creature, an emotional creature. What would you say if you, if you had to knee-jerk reaction, describe a human being? Everyone would have our translation. What does the Torah say? Human being a very cryptic and mystical definition, actually. Human being created in the divine image. B'tzalmenu kidmusenu tselem elikim. Divine image. And then it continues that God takes a, a clump of earth. Earth. And what does he do? Vayipach ba'apav nishmas chayim. And he imbues it. He blows into it the breath of God. And hence comes the word neshama. Neshama can also be read, neshima. And that's how actually the sages explain it. Neshama, soul, is breath. The breath of God. And this is the Greek root for the word psyche, psychology. The breath, the study of breath. The study of the breath of God, otherwise known as the soul, imbued inside the body. And here is where you see a completely different perspective that Judaism offers us, that Descartes, and even the religious thinkers, including the Christians and others, never really got. They saw two forces at work. The force of the body, physical, and the spiritual. And Judaism did not see it that way. Judaism sees Hashem Echad means there is no duality. But as opposed to the mechanical model that I described earlier, that there is no soul, everything is just a bunch of neurons and programming and DNA, the Jewish way of thinking is this. The body is just another form of divine expression. It's actually all soul. The fact that we are myopic in our vision and we have a narrow look at existence doesn't make it reality. So in truth, it's all one divine plan. A divine plan that begins with a soul in the image of God, which manifests what we call an ashama beguf, a soul enters into the body. And from here on, in our minds and in this physical world, a duality emerges, two, two forces. 
the voice of transcendence, the voice of survival. You could say maybe the voice of pleasure and power, Freud and Adler, and the voice of meaning and transcendence. And we, many of us, think that it's two worlds that are conflict with each other. And they are initially a conflict. But when you read the Jewish mystical teachings, and I'll particularly quote something that I'm studying myself now in depth, a fundamental discourse from the Rebbe Rashab called Hemshech Ayim Beis, delivered when? In 1916 through the, through the I'm sorry, 19, 19, oh, 1912 through 1916, and developing an unbelievable approach that the mind is actually simply an interface between the soul and the body. So if you think of it that way, it goes even further than man's search of meaning. It's not just that we have meaning at the core of us, it's actually the bridge to, to eliminate the duality that everybody struggles with. And it's ultimately being at peace and recognizing, as some say, that we are not physical beings on a spiritual journey, we're spiritual beings on a physical journey. Just to capture the point, many people ask the question, where does the soul go to when we die? You know, big question everyone asks, where does the soul go when we die? And we all of us have different types of answers, but then at some point, hearing the question so many times, something struck me that maybe the entire question is based on a false premise. The question is based on the premise that you're where it's at, so you wonder, where does the soul go to? It's a good question. But what about, what about if you find out that the assumption that you are where it's at is not correct? So let's take an imaginary dialogue between a refrigerator and electricity. And the refrigerator says to electricity, where do you go to electricity when, Mr. Electricity, where do you go to when the plug is pulled? And of course, the electricity responds, what kind of nerve, incredulously, what kind of chutzpah do you have? You're a little box they just invented you the last 100, 200 years. You figured out how to generate and contain electricity in this box. And now you wonder, you think you're the center of the universe, you ask me where I go. You're the novelty. You just came on, the, on board a few uh, years ago. I've always been around, and I go back to where I always was. Not contained by a little box like you. It's electricity outside of the regular parameters of time and space as we know. So when you think of it this way, and I've shared this with many people, even people who have not necessarily any conscious faith. Everyone says, that's an interesting way of looking at it. It's exactly right. We, are going, we who know so little about even the human being, this five six foot frame that weighs 100, 150 pounds, I won't go higher than that. And we barely know and understand our conscious lives, let alone our unconscious or superconscious. And we're gonna determine that where does the soul go to? Maybe there's a whole different way of looking at it. And I would say Viktor Frankl, and that's why the Rebbe sent that message to him, got the picture, he got it, but he got it under duress, under very dire circumstances. I always wonder, had he not been in the concentration camps, would he have also developed this theory? However, he did. And he has that merit because he was able to see in a world and actually suffer for it personally. He's about to resign. Able to see that amidst the chaotic 20th century with the materialistic perspectives that were emerging and even psychology and human beings rendered into machines, all you have to do is read Richard Dawkins' The Selfish Gene or other such uh, radical atheist book, and they'll explain to you everything in life, even the most transcendent, beautiful, noble thing comes down to survival of the fittest, the selfish gene. And this is a prevailing way of thinking, and Frankl defied that. And he got the support, and because of that, he serves a role in a juncture, a historical juncture, where he did not allow psychology to fall into the abyss of a completely selfish, pleasure or power-oriented force in life. And the consequences are far-reaching. Because what does it end up being when you think of a human being as being a soul in a body instead of a body that contains a soul? It, this is, it means that what do we expect of human beings, number one? Expectations. What can you already expect from a Freudian model or an Adlerian model, or if you want to put it, some call it the Darwinian Freudian model, in the context of uh, social Darwinism, where survival of the fittest is the number one drive, pleasure, power, whatever the self decides. What can you really expect from someone? You can expect, you know, follow the rules, red lights, green lights. But fundamentally, you're at the heart, you're an id. 
a driving force of sexual or other forms of pleasure. It's me, me, me. We expect you to somewhat tame it. But what, how high can a human being reach? Now, Freud got it half right. There is a force beneath us. But there's an id and there's a yid. And if you add, you go a step deeper, there's the yud. The pinta the yid, the yud, the spark. A yud is like a spark. And that, so it's true, we also say Yetzir Leva Odam Raman Urov in the second chapter of the Torah. Not the first. The first time it introduced the evil inclination that we're capable of selfishness and we're capable of base, following base instincts and so on is in the second chapter. Yetzir Leva Odam Raman Urov. That's where the word Yetzir Hara comes from, the, 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 the other side. But the first chapter, Bereshit, Salam Alekim, the real core of a human being is not it, it's the yud before the it, the spark, the divine spark. And then the expectations of a human being are beyond the sky and beyond. You're a piece of the divine. You were sent here as God's messenger to change the world. Nothing in life can stand in the way if you allow yourself to embrace that. Nothing. And if you do, in some ways, uh, have a setback or feel down, that's due to your own limitation. A psychology based on that expects the most of somebody. Now, obviously, it has to be customized and tailored to a person's state of mind. You can't just come and say, someone who suffered trauma or some depression or some other difficult thing, hey, you know something? You're a divine image. But developed into a modality, developed into a psychological model of working with someone, you have, you're working toward the divine itself. The second difference would be, instead of duality, we don't have to struggle with these two voices inside of us. It's one voice. It's one God who wanted us to go through the challenge. The challenge Viktor Frankl went through in his personal life. The challenge, God forbid, we went through collectively in the Holocaust and so on. And this is not a justification. It just explains that we go through challenges. And the challenges make us stronger. And we discover deeper purpose in them as hard as it may be to understand philosophically. So the, so the, and there are very many more far-reaching implications. Obviously, we're here for an entire day. We'll sure hear great stuff from uh, the different uh, professionals and uh, speakers and so on. I just wanted to lay out the context and really conclude with the following, that there is no duality. When you ask the question, is Torah compatible with psychology? Not only compatible, it is psychology. It is the root of the study of the soul. However, we have something today that we did not have a thousand years ago or 500 years ago. We have now a secular models that actually work. We have academics, many of them who may not have been driven by faith, have developed approaches. So we can turn now the Torah psychology into a true working model. Because as much as you see the Torah as that source, when you read the Torah, you're not going to find interventions that are necessarily able to apply. So our challenge is how do we bridge the Torah's base study of the soul and understanding of the soul and understanding of the purpose of a human being in actualizing the soul on earth into working models, into working interventions, how to deal with the challenges that unfortunately life brings us. But it's a very exhilarating and exciting challenge. And I personally, I'm not a professional psychologist, but I challenge all my colleagues here this, I believe, is our challenge of our time. And now more than ever, because whatever existed at the beginning of the 20th century, today it's far, far more challenging because of our freedoms, because of leisure, because of free time, there's a breeding ground for the worst, but also for the best. And I want to quote Frankl, something that's less known, where he talks about freedom. This is a quote from him he was suggesting that he recommended that the Statue of Liberty on the East Coast be complemented by a Statue of Responsibility on the West Coast. I don't know if he meant Hollywood or not, but whatever. And this is what he writes. Freedom, however, is not the last word. Freedom is only part of the story and half of the truth. Freedom is but the negative aspect of the whole phenomenon whose positive aspect is responsibility or responsibleness. In fact, freedom is in danger of degenerating into more, mere arbitrariness, unless it is lived in terms of responsibleness. That is why I recommend that the Statue of Liberty on the East Coast be supplemented by a Statue of Responsibility on the West Coast. And I say this because I find this to be a very fascinating, not footnote, because it's a key element. 
What are most American young people excited about today? I don't just mean today, in our times. Sports, music, sexuality, video games, meaning, you know. The pleasure principle, maybe the power principle, which you could throw money into there as well. So we're dealing here with now an environment that we have a lot of free time. Admiral Adam Rickover, you've heard of him. He was a, actually came from the Europe, Jew. He rose to the highest state of the four-star admiral in the US Navy, which is the highest level you can reach in the Navy, four-star. And he delivered a paper in 1955 um, in the United States, and a very interesting statistic, which is, I think, very important to note. In 19, he, writes, he says the following, that in 1855, 95% of gen en energy generated in the world was generated by, through human labor. In 1955, in 100 years, 95% of energy is generated by machines. Think of the staggering amount of time suddenly we have in our hands. And of course, this explains also the way why wealth so exploded in those hundred years. Because even though there were wealthy people in the 19th century and the 18th and so on, but it was not that extreme. Once energy is not being generated by people working and toiling in a field for eight hours to, to yield a uh, sack of potatoes, what do we do with the free time? And now throw into the picture the internet and technology. So how much free time do people have on their hands? Nobody even wants to acknowledge it. And how much, what do we use it for? So we have now a breeding ground for, as they say in uh, mystical terms, for every form of spiritual bacteria, which is, of course, the root of all psychological issues. And, of course, the best medicine is preventive medicine. Um, it was Frederick Douglass that said that it's far easier to bring up a healthy child than to fix a broken adult. How many hours you spend one hour with a, healthy, with a child, and how many hours you need to spend with an adult to repair what happened? It's, it's mind-blowing if you think about it. But we have to deal with whatever we deal. Like one person told me, but unfortunately, the only way to get to the children is through the, through the broken adults, because they're the parents of those children. Okay, fine. The point I want to make is we have our challenges, but thank God we also have Magdim Rafu Alamaka, as they say. Before any challenge, we're given the cure. And Dr. Frankel definitely deserves to be commended for it, because a component. I would say, and I'm sure he would agree too, it's a stepping stone. We still need a full model that will encompass um, all the challenges, but using that idea and using Torah, absolutely using Torah, because that's where you'll get the deepest understanding of the soul. Because at the end of the day, who knows, who knows what the soul looks like? None of these psychologists, no psychiatrist has ever seen a soul. So bodies we can take x-rays of. Is there an x-ray of the soul? The answer is yes, in the Torah. The Torah calls itself a blueprint of creation. The human being is a microcosm of existence. It's created in the divine image. From our flesh we behold God. We, our DNA, our genetics, our psychological makeup is a reflection of the divine plan. And when you study the soul, especially in mystical thought, Kabbalistic thought, Hasidic thought, you get an x-ray of the soul. I repeat that again, an x-ray of the soul. So you have then a template you know, when a doctor takes, let's say, an x-ray of, of lungs, then you compare it, you juxtapose it over healthy lungs, and you have something to work with. This is what we need to develop, a the map of the spiritual genome, and then apply that with all the modalities that we have today to healing this ailing world, starting with one soul at a time. That's a challenge. And when we find that formula, which we have plenty of pieces of, and I believe this day today, is dedicated to that, you find a formula that will actually transform the world and bring it back to its original psychology. The study of the soul, the soul as it was intended by the creator himself, by the architect, by the engineer who created the soul in his own image. And when we can align ourselves with that and therefore also align and, and, and get rid of the misalignments that don't allow us, then we have the model of the healthy human being, body and soul, all as one, one seamless unity, serving and fulfilling its divine purpose, or in the words of uh, Viktor Frankl, man's search for meaning. Thank you very much.